Welcome to the party. What is the chance for a defensive resurgence for the Vikings? And why are some of us out on Kellen Mond? That's coming up on today's Minnesota Football Party. Subscribe to the show via the Locked On Sports Minnesota YouTube channels and any of your podcast feeds. It's endless Vikings talk from local experts. Let's meet the group. Arif Hassan of TheAthletic.com at Arif Hassan NFL. He joins us along with Luke Inman at Luke underscore Spinman, the host of Superior Sports Talk with Reggie Wilson and Luke Braun of Locked on Vikings. Gentlemen, give me something to start the day. Luke Braun, how was your sleep? <laughs> what sleep? <laughs> I'll sleep when I'm dead. Oh, I'm sorry. Did we wake you up with your contractual <laughs> obligation? I'm sorry. <laughs> You, you do look refreshed, Luke. I feel like you had some good REM. You don't have night. to lie to me. It's okay. <laughs> well, no, I mean, the, the bags under your eyes are, what, like half the size they often are? I mean, this is great. <laughs> great hey, thanks, Arif. Hey, let's not take him That's off That's the nicest he... thing you're going to say on, to me on this whole show, isn't it? Luke's going to call weeks. his agent, and he's going to go hide in his uh, <laughs> movie trailer for the next two hours. So uh, let's we better get this show on the road, Sam. We are one episode and one minute into this podcast series, and already we have a bit. It's Luke Braun oversleeping like that, and that yep. is a thing now. <laughs> if, it, if it never happens again, it is still a thing forever. So that's imprinted now on this uh, the fabric of this show. Ron Johnson joins us as well. He's our guest of honor today, the host of the Ron Johnson Show. That's coming up later. I've got a question for the group to kick things off. The Vikings were bad at defense last year. That's no shock to anybody. They were 30th in yards allowed, 25th in points allowed. What is the chance of a resurgence? What is the realistic chance that Ed Donatel coaxes a turnaround in this group to get them back to respectability? Arif, we begin with you. All right, there's three things at play here. One is statistical regression. Two is personnel changes. Three is the coordinator change i think that there's a good chance statistical regression is in the vikings favor um they were 12th in epa for play defensively 16th in dvoa uh they dropped off significantly after daniel hunter was injured although i think a lot of that is noise i think a lot of it is also just daniel hunter so having him healthy will be huge um and so that kind of change uh statistically i think is going to mean a lot for the vikings positively um the second thing uh, is that I think the Vikings are better personnel wise by who they brought in. Um, obviously, you know, I think Jordan Hicks is a little bit of a downgrade over Anthony Barr in Anthony Barr's role, but an upgrade over um, Anthony Barr and what Jordan Hicks's role is going to be. So that might actually be um, a positive. Patrick Peterson seems to be playing well in camp, and I have some level of confidence that they'll have a good outside corner opposite him. So that's pretty good. Obviously, they're going to be set at the safety position. So I like the personnel. Um, the one thing that I think we should be really careful about, though, is that it is easy to underrate the defensive impact that a coordinator like Mike Zimmer has. He is a remarkable defensive mind. I know that the final two minutes of the first half and the final two minutes in general of either half were really dramatic for Vikings fans, right? And they were the worst the, the NFL has ever seen in the history of the NFL. That's not going to sustain itself. It's going to get a lot better defensively. But the other 56 minutes, I think, will likely get worse. Not because Ed Donatel mm -hmm. is a bad defensive coordinator. He's probably a good one. Um, but because Mike Zimmer was a tremendous defensive coordinator. And I think that we're not going to see the same level of defensive game planning, uh, the same level of matchups, the same level of the ability to create offensive confusion. Um, I think that that's going to drop down. And so I think the net effect of this is that we might see a defense um, that will probably improve in terms of points allowed per game because you're those final two minutes, but um, will probably not be from play to play better. 128 points allowed in the final two minutes of halves. That definitely gets better. That was 30% of the points they allowed all of last Jeez. season. Um, they DVO, were really good in the other 56 minutes. No, it's they were amazing. Could, could statistical regression, though, work the other way? Because they were second in sacks. They were fourth in third down percentage. They were fifth in turnover di differential. That like, third down percentage. Those are the Zimmer special. I know. Mm -hmm. And those are the things that Zimmer, I think, assisted with scheming up sacks, scheming up third down plays. That's the stuff for the other 56 minutes that could get worse. So while the, like it, this could be weirdly a worse defense that has better underlying stats. Luke Braun, your thoughts? Um, I don't know. Yes, 
statistically they might have a better shot. Um, we lost a Luke. We lost one of uh, the Lukes. Well, we got a backup. Uh, he's back. Oh, hey, Luke. <laughs> got depth at the Luke position. <laughs> <laughs> You know, if they what they say, if you have two Lukes, you don't have any. Um, <laughs> look, the Fangio scheme, I think, is going to take time to like gel and set in. I think the start of it is going to be kind of ugly. They're relying on a lot of youth on the outside, and that's going to be a lot of learning on the fly and a lot of we'll go with learning experiences. The thing about the Donatel scheme that people are, I think, not real like. This is something you lose when you uh, change to a new scheme. But in particular, the Donatel scheme relies a lot on cover one concepts, on man to man concepts. And if you can't, if you don't have the horses to run man to man, if your corners are struggling, which like if Cameron Dantzler ends up winning the starting job and then struggles, like we've seen that before, um, there are tools the Fangio scheme has. They can go to more like quarter quarter half stuff, they can go to more uh, zone match concepts. Um, did a really in-depth thing on Locked On Vikings uh, today, so go check that out for more. But um, that is just not quite as powerful as their cover one concepts. And if they can keep up man-to-man -man across the board, that's when you can start doing stuff like having Harrison Smith roam around and read the quarterback and try to jump a, a pass or something like that. Um I don't know if that gets unlocked until the corners can hold it down, and the corners aren't going to be able to hold it down week one. So this is going to be ugly to start, and then I think at least by year two, and if we're lucky, maybe a little earlier, that's when I think we can see the defense really start to build on something that can outdo what Zimmer did in the last couple of years. But I think it's going to be tough to start. Yeah, Luke number two, the spinman. Um, th these guys have mentioned the cornerback play. Don't you feel like jettisoning two of the worst corners in football last year in Breland and Alexander. I mean, doesn't that automatically improve your potential to not give up those those massive passing plays and a lot of those connections in the last two minutes? I feel like that alone is, is evidence as to why this defense could get better. What are your thoughts? No, I certainly agree there. I mean, uh, you, you got to wonder how much Patrick Peterson you're relying on and on him to be your number one cornerback, how much he's got left in the tank and what those legs he can do and how they can hold him. Andrew Booth certainly seems to look the part so far in camp, but I agree with the brief. It's going to be tough to replace those 56 minutes under Mike Zimmer that we've seen for seven, eight years under him. And Luke Braun brought up a great point too. How quickly can they hit the ground running is this a system that takes a full year for them to really get acclimated and get comfortable and get their feet wet just based off last year's statistics i know Arif mentioned a bunch of good ones but there's a handful of statistics you can't really get much worse 24th points allowed 30th and yards allowed near the bottom in multiple passing categories so there's only one way to go up or, or excuse me there's only one way to go and that's up i don't know if i can sit here it's going to be a resurgence as you said but from the personnel standpoint, you mentioned some cornerbacks. You add a first-round safety. You're adding Daniil Hunter and Zadarius Smith now. Two elite pass rushers went at their best. Huge for the uh, pass defense, uh, as we know. And then it comes down to, again, how quickly can this returning talent get acclimated in this new system? Guys that have been under Mike Zimmer's defense for years and years, learning a whole new defensive system for the first time in some of them, their careers. How long does that adjustment take to get rolling? How quickly can they jump out of the gate where everyone's on the same page and understanding one another's assignments? And then how long does it take those rookies that you're going to depend on in the secondary for uh, rather large roles and seeing Booth and possibly a Caleb Evans as well? How long does it take them to get acclimated to the NFL speed and nuances? Hard to say. Early signs, again, point to Booth adjusting pretty quickly so far. Seen mixed in with the ones, it sounds like, uh, once in a while at camp. But until you see them in week one, I just can't say for certain. But no doubt, I expect them to start to veer closer to the middle of the pack in a lot of these categories when it comes to statistically speaking. But I think being even in the middle of the league in defense from where you came from would be a huge improvement and give your offense more opportunities to go do their job and win you football games. But the big question 
is, uh, again, do they look lost with these blown assignments those first few weeks, like Luke mentioned, or can they hit the ground running those first few weeks? Pressure's going to be on, too. Remember, they start with Aaron Rodgers at home week one, and then those Philadelphia Eagles offense in week two, huge litmus test right away. And we'll get an idea, again, just how much better they, they, they are from last year uh, early on. Yeah, the Eagles is going to test the run defense, which is mm -hmm. really where the Vikings gave up a ton of yardage last year. The successful run rate against them was astronomically good. And Ed Donatel, when he oversaw the Broncos' resurgence, they went from 25th to 3rd last year, which is really what the Vikings would love to do as well. Now, granted, that was with the continuity of having Donatel for multiple years, and they were able to to sort of you know shift some things around within that that scheme and that team. But the biggest thing the Broncos did was they fixed the run defense. They were abysmal, and then they were suddenly pretty good. So can the shift to the three four fix the Vikings' run defense? And I know run defense is not imp as important as pass defense. That was easily like the biggest issue late in halves and late in games when the cornerbacks just couldn't defend people. Um, but fixing that run defense is going to be a pretty big piece too. They don't have Michael Pierce anymore. Uh, do you guys feel like the run defense is, is sitting on improvement? Luke Braun. I, so I think the thing the Broncos did was they got Patrick Sertain and that uh, unlocked a whole bunch of that defense. But for the, on the Vikings side, um, I, I, feel like we're still going to see some problems. We still have a big hole up front in the base packages for as often as they will run them. If, if you know, O'Connell says it's like 20%, but that's still a lot of plays where you have like Armand Watts there. I don't know how much we trust him. Um, and again, if the corners can't hold up outside, that means you kind of can't feel as good stacking the box. And these, these defenses want to live with two high safeties anyways like whether their pass defense is playing well or not it's just kind of how they how they work um hey there's my alarm <laughs> sure to wake up yep i'll try um <laughs> but like it's a very i don't know alarm I, <laughs> <laughs> I, I think i figured out what happened last week uh <laughs> But like Harrison Phillips, I, I love and Dalvinson Tom Dalvin Tomlinson next to each other. Like I love that duo. But then you have Armand Watts, um, can Daniel Hunter and Zadarius Smith stay healthy? I think there are definitely going to be issues with lightened out boxes against like spread out offenses. Um, but again, kind of only to start. And then once the corners, once we figure out what we're doing on the outside, it'll free up those safeties to do a lot more, to have a lot more uh, of a roll and run support. And then I think things can kind of shore up over time. It's just, you know, that first half of the season might might be a little rough. So Luke Braun pointed to Patrick Sertan as sort of a magic bullet for the Broncos defense. Arif, do the Vikings have a magic bullet player that can get them over the top with, with a sizable impact? Yeah, so obviously, you know, they bring in Andrew Booth, they bring in Lewis Seen. I think actually, um, instead of, you know, kind of the pure talent level replacement that you get from Booth over Dantzler or Seen over Bynum, which, you know, that second one, I don't even know if in year one that that is a significant upgrade of an upgrade at all. Um, and, and this is more a compliment to Bynum that is an insult to Seen. Um, I, I don't know that the strict personnel upgrade that talent level upgrade is going to be as important as trying to find a way to get kind of your best 11 defensive players on the field at the same time which might mean some dime packages that put both scene and booth on the field that might mean you know which would you know maybe take jordan hicks off the field it might mean taking off one of the defensive linemen um off the field uh and and finding ways to to help out there i think uh kind of the 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 kernel that luke is pointing to um that would you know be an interesting one to evaluate is whether or not the run defense flows from the pass defense, right? Because uh, essentially what Luke is saying is that once you have the ability to kind of um, trust your cornerbacks to win on the outside, the more you can send your safeties to help in run support, um, which is kind of an element of these Fangio style defenses where, you know, that safety um, plays a somewhat important role in filling in the gaps, right? And the reason the safety can play so far back in that defense is because the way the defensive linemen are playing forces the running back to take just a little extra time, just a half second pause in terms of identifying the run lanes, which gives the linebackers time, but it also allows the safety time to come in from deep and help out in run support. 
Now, that obviously can only happen if the defensive linemen are playing well. That's obviously an important element of run defense. But the way that you can let that safety be more aggressive about filling in that gap late is by knowing that you can kind of trust those cornerbacks. And so I think um, the idea that your run defense flows from your pass defense, as opposed to most defensive systems where it is kind of the other way around, um, I think that that is going to be kind of an underrated element of evaluating how that total defensive package is going to come together, whether or not the Vikings can improve in the run defense. And I don't know that from a personnel standpoint, they'll get that from year one. And as a side note, I've been very impressed with what Cameron Dancer has been able to do in camp. Um, but um, I, I think that the way that Donatel is willing to experiment in camp so far with what that defensive setup looks like means that it's on the top of their mind in terms of ways that they can kind of enable that happening. Last one on this, and I direct it to Luke Inman. So when we evaluate this defense, Luke, we account for the best of these veterans. We assume that Harrison Smith will be Harrison Smith, Eric Hendricks will be Eric Hendricks, et cetera, et cetera. But due to age, injury, what have you, do you see any of these veteran players approaching a dangerous cliff? Maybe it's Patrick Peterson. Maybe it's Harrison. Maybe Daniil Hunter just won't be the same off a couple of years with major injuries. Are you concerned about any of those stalwarts maybe not carrying the weight that Vikings fans and coaches are hoping that they will? Yeah, I think of the names that you mentioned, Sam, I keep going back to Patrick Peterson because I think he's already shown signs of aging and slowing down. We know he's just not the Patrick Peterson household name that we saw in Arizona their first five, six years coming out as what, a top five, six draft pick. So um, that one certainly scares me. And I go back to Luke Brown's point too. Great point about what the Broncos were able to do when you got that number one lockdown magic bullet, as you called it, Sam Stud, as a number one cornerback. And the Vikings certainly do not have that. They've got a, a nice, you know, group of uh, two or three kind of tier two guys, but no number one lockdown guy that you can just put out on an island and like a reset, just bring up that safety and help and run support. So that scares me going back to, again, you asked Luke about that uh, run based defense. KOC sounds like, all right, we're only going to be in it one every four or five plays, but still remember Mike Zimmer lived off winning on first and second down in his scheme and sending up that third and long, but it always started with guys like Limval, the big beef eaters in the middle to win against the run and set up those long third and long situations to drop the exotic blitzes. So Patrick Peterson's probably the easy one. Um, I think that, you know, outside of that, I think you point to Zedarius Smith. I know he's, what, 29, 30 years old, but coming off the yeah. back injury as well scares me quite a bit. Yeah. You could say that for both Daniil and uh, Zedarius, I'm sure. But um, Harrison Smith seems to be keep you know defining age here, it seems like, and you guys have been out of camp more than I have, but it sounds like Harrison Smith... I mean, no, he's not a spring chicken, but still looks like a, a you know, near Pro Bowl type of talent that we've always been used to. And maybe he's still got two, three good years left in the tank. All right. We've got Ron Johnson coming up. Arif and I are going to rip Kellen Mond together, and we're going to do it with ferocity. But first, I'm going to tell you about Built Bars. Built Bars are unbelievably good. They're constantly coming out with new flavors. Have you had the puffs yet? Oh, the puffs are so good. They're really one of life's greatest joys because they're covered in chocolate. They have a lot of collagen protein and very little sugar. Why wouldn't you go get Built Bars? You should go get Built Bars right now, and you should do it at Built.com using the promo code LOCKED15. Get 15% off your order. Promo code LOCKED15 to get cookie dough chunk puff built bars so much texture so much fluff so much goodness did i mention the promo code it's lock 15 at built.com uh before we get into our next talking points i'm going to throw you guys into the four minute drill now yesterday greg joseph starting to silence me a little bit i've been the greg joseph antagonist he goes eight for eight in his first kicking session at tco uh, was extremely confident in his distance. I think he only had one that was even flirting with an upright, so he was really good yesterday. Um, I want you guys to make a one-minute argument as to why Greg Joseph should or shouldn't be entrusted as this team's kicker. We'll go clockwise, which means we start with a reef. You have one minute go. 
Yeah, I think that you should give Greg Joseph the chance. I think, first of all, you bring in Matt Daniels as your special teams coordinator. You trust what he can do. He's actually got uh, a pretty strong lineage. I don't know pedigree, but a pretty strong lineage of people that he's worked with uh, and understanding how the kicking game works. And they've got uh, a pretty strong history of kicking games in his history. So I think that you trust that. But also, um, I, I don't know why you would hold a training camp competition um, when you've already held one and have already declared a winner and the person who's winning is actually doing well in training camp. I think that um, the Vikings have long held problems with special teams. If there is an inherent problem with the Vikings special teams unit, it's not going to be solved by bringing in a new kicker. That is a curse the franchise just bears. You can't uh, you know, win it by bringing in somebody else from the outside. So I think that you should trust Greg Joseph. I'm highly skeptical of him, but with a new coaching staff and with somebody Ten. who's performing well in camp, you just got to give him the job and hope that he can perform. Luke, you've got five extra seconds that Arif left you. Go ahead. Go for it. Well, you go off his track record. This is a what-have-you-done-for-me-lately league. I think Joseph made some big kicks last year, but obviously we know he missed a, a lot of big kicks. And until that final stretch of the season, he just wasn't very dependable or consistent. And for that matter, before the Vikings signed him, he wasn't much of a household name going from team to team every season up until this point with the Vikings. I think it's great. Obviously, he goes, what, 8 for 8 yesterday from practice from 50-plus, it sounded like. And his coaches are raving about him. Help boost his confidence. Again, that's great. But to not bring in a competition was wild to me. And I think it just kind of disappointed a little bit. Uh, like you, Sam, that you mentioned last week on the show when I found that out. Hopefully it all works out. But just to go into the season, I guess, without a backup plan or at least training camp, to have no plan B at such a critical phase of the game that you know firsthand, special teams kicking is the difference seconds. between 10 and 7, making the playoffs, and 8 and 9 sitting at home. So uh, unwise, we know in Viking country, to rely on a kicker in big spots to win big games not the ideal game plan or mindset for this front office luke braun so first things first this whole thing is moot god wills that we are in pain and that's going to happen no matter what we do <laughs> but if we're gonna try i am always an advocate that you bring in a guy compete to compete with the kicker no matter who he is every year bring in some undrafted guy don't spend anything on him but just bring in somebody to push the kicker they did that and the competition was over before otas were so if you ask me, and I'm not going to use all the time here, that's all you need. And Greg Joseph has won the job. Good job. Let's see you week one. That's not a real competition with Gabe Bur Burkich. I mean, if, sure you're, was. if your Why competition not? is cut in OTAs, I mean, Riley Patterson his ass. put up a bigger... He didn't. I was there. They were equal. <laughs> I don't know why. I don't know why there was such a chasm between them that Burkich was cut. Yeah, I don't know if he I, insulted. I was there too. Burkich was not lighting up the world, man. He was missing. Well, neither he was, was Joseph. Missing. Okay, he was all right. Be Joseph was all right. Before I rip him, happy birthday to Greg Joseph. He turns twenty-eight today, oh. August fourth. <laughs> happy birthday. Um, <laughs> do this on his birthday first his wife left now this yeah <laughs> <laughs> if you know you know the vikings are going to bat for a guy who is 18th in field goal percentage last year and 22nd in extra point percentage okay those are mediocre statistics. Let's see what he's done historically, though, because maybe he's got like a oh, track you're, you're record. You can bring up that, like the six games he had in Tennessee. All right, that indicates it. it was a full season in Cleveland, <laughs> Arif. It was a full season, 18th and 29th. So what has he done ever to be entrusted to be? It's not, it's, it's not about the, what he's done. It's about what he will do. Matt Daniels is declaring that he will have a career year. Well, it doesn't take much. Because he hasn't had very good seasons. He missed multiple clutch kicks last year. Carolina game, Detroit game, obviously the Arizona game. That's problematic. I don't care what he does in practice, all right? If he misses another kick at the end of a game, that just shows you the fragility of the Greg Joseph psyche. So I'm out. I'm out on the exclusive kicker thing. I want competition, and I want it now. And that's the four-minute drill. I really shouldn't go last because I get worked up into a lather and then I have yeah, to calm down. You, you no, that's why you should go last. That <laughs> was great. That was yeah. great. I don't know how I – I should have uh, saved the ad read for there. Built Bar. <laughs> <laughs> um, let's talk about Kellen Mond and quarterbacks as we uh, await the appearance of one Ron Johnson. So Arif and I, we, uh, we're buddies. We stand shoulder to shoulder sometimes in the hot Egan sun, and we watch Kellen Mond not play well. 
It's um, if it's not one thing, it's another. It's uh, fumbled snaps. It's you know checkdowns. It's tucking the ball and running in a practice setting, unable to find a first read. It's indecisiveness. I can't think of a day where I walked away impressed by Kellen Mond. And by contrast, I think Kirk Cousins has played pretty well this camp. And the gap between them is astounding. And they've tried. They've tried to give him second team reps. So I guess the level of competition is a tad higher that he's going against. But it's not good, Arif. So you've borne witness to the same stuff I've seen. Tell me I'm right or tell me I'm wrong. All right. Well, uh, I'll preface this by saying I ultimately think that you're right, but I will say a couple of things. One, he did actually look fine on the first day that he threw the ball uh, in training camp. So I'll give him that. It's every other day that gives me concern. Uh, but beyond that, you, have, you do have to remember that um, when he's with the second team, very often it's the first team defense out there. That's just for whatever reason, that's the way they're doing a lot of these reps. First team offense goes against second team defense. First team defense goes up against second team offense, at least for a while. Obviously, by the time they get the situational and some other elements of the, the team drills, um, they do they do match strength against strength. And so he's often going up against people like Patrick Peterson, Harrison Smith, Eric Kendricks, Daniil Hunter. Um, and so you do have to kind of give him that when he's throwing to Amir Smith-Marset, when Amir Smith-Marset is covered by Patrick Peterson. That's just not going to be uh, an easy situation for him. That said, uh, when you do see receivers streaking open on an over route for a touchdown and Kellen Mond misses that guy to dump off to Zach Davidson, um, that My guy. That's I mean, great for Zach Davidson, bad for Kellen Mond, because you've got an open receiver in the end zone, in your progression, in your timing that you're declining to choose for a dump off. That's not good. It's also not good uh, that when he does take these deep shots, he is horrendous. And I, they don't, they're not even that deep. They're like 15 yards deep. But as soon as he's either off platform or throwing a deep shot, he is inaccurate. He consistently leads defensive backs into receivers instead of receivers away from defensive backs. It's bad. His timing is off, as you've mentioned. And the thing is, you and I are standing on the sidelines. We're not professional quarterbacks. We're not, you know, we don't have an innate sense of when the ball should get out. And so when we can see that the ball is coming out late, that must mean it is catastrophically late um, because he always seems to wait for a half second to confirm uh, whether or not he should throw the ball. And while that is, I think, an understandable impulse for a rookie Going, uh, going in team drills, I think that by the time you're in your second year and you're doing it against air, that's a problem. The fact that he is doing it when there are no defenders on the field and he's waiting to see if his receiver is getting out of his break, that's brutal to me. I don't even know if he's technically looking to see if someone is um, open or I don't know if he's technically confirming. He might just be that kind of quarterback that when he sees it, it takes him a second to throw it. That's not good. That's just not going to win you NFL games. And the fact that he's got a strong arm is irrelevant if he's not going to be able to fit tight windows with good timing. It's irrelevant if he doesn't have the ability to hit deep with any accuracy. And it's irrelevant if uh, he can't see when someone's about to break open as opposed to can only see when somebody is already open. I, I For me, this is, um, I don't know if catastrophic is the right word because it is just a backup quarterback. But for him, it is a ba it is a catastrophic camp for him because he's supposed to have the second season where things slow down for him, where things um, are, are getting to the point where he has the ability to compete. And I if you, if you started a game tomorrow and Kirk came down with COVID or something, I would absolutely, once again, trust Sean Mannion instead of Kellen Mond out there. Kirk so would be, you're telling uh, us there's a chance. Got Kirk it. would be okay. relaxing nicely <laughs> cool. at home. Cool, cool, cool. Right, uh, relaxing. God. Yeah, he'd be, he'd be all relaxed. Uh, so Luke Inman, having heard that, having heard that just scathing indictment of Kellen Mond, the, the, the other side of the argument is you want to roll the dice with Mannion again after what you saw at Lambeau, after what you saw, you know, his previous start a couple of years before. And just generally, I think his game manager persona that we kind of understand what he is what which way would you go with it i don't want to i don't want to roll with sean Mannion, but it sounds like i don't have a choice really and and Arif's not the only one who's mentioned i've seen a bunch of i haven't been out there like you two but seen plenty of you know not great observations and, and news and notes from kellen mon so far I would love to be able to sit here and say, hey, you drafted a third-round developmental guy last year. He's showing some serious strides. He's got some potential, a little bit more movement in the pocket, maybe can create some plays with his feet, unlike Kirk Cousins. But uh, that's simply just not the case. And 
Um, is it too early to give up on him? Maybe, but you know, maybe you could say ah, he's learning a new playbook again, a new system. KOC's maybe a little bit more exotic in his looks and verbiage and things like that. But all signs are pointing this guy is is nowhere near close to being a guy that you can depend on as your number two backup quarterback. So Sean Mannion, yeah, not great. I don't want to roll with him by any means, but at least you know what you're getting. And uh, you know, game manager, quote unquote. Um, even that is is pretty, I think, being nice for Sean Mannion from what we saw from the Green Bay game last year. So no great options here, Sam, by any means. But you would think by now, I think they played it right on paper. You got your star number one quarterback. You got the vet, the clipboard holder, the veteran who's obviously going to help groom the young kid along. But this young kid just never really took any steps to show you that even um, even if he's still a year or two out, there's still enough potential here uh, for him to grow into that number two role. But sounds like uh, at least early in camp. What are we a weekend? Um, that sounds like not that is not the case. Yeah, we'll get, give Luke Braun a shot here, and then we'll go to our guest of honor, Ron Johnson. Luke. Yeah, I, if you want somebody other than Mond and Mannion, uh, I don't know what's out there. Short of like trying to wake Cam Newton Jimmy. up, Jimmy. Oh my God, Jimmy! Jesus, it, it's dark. So here's what I'm gonna do. All right, I'm gonna put on the tinfoil, and I got a theory. Um, so I've, I've got a literal have that by your computer all the time. I have a tinfoil hat by my computer for precisely this for reason. Yes. Vikings. Okay. Great. Yes. Mm. Uh, so here's the deal. <laughs> Kellen Mond is on a. We'll go with a development plan, a development arc. And my, my tinfoil theory is that this is what it's supposed to look like. Uh, he is, for well, it was supposed to look like this last year, but last year because of COVID and what that did to his body, call last year a rehab year. Now, uh, don't give me that look, Arif. I've got a tinfoil hat on right now. Um, that's, that, that reinforces my look. That's why he's looking at you. <laughs> okay. I can't uh, stop laughing. This is too good. <laughs> But now, like when when Kellen Mond, when the Vikings drafted Kellen Mond, and I actually like looked into him, my first thought was, okay, this dude needs to have everything about his game undone and rebuilt from the ground up, and then maybe some of his physical talent can be utilized. But the way he plays right now, it'll never work. Um, and so that means you have to change the way um, his footwork is. You had to change the way his release was. You had to change the way he reads defenses, which. While that's all being undone and you're asking him to break all his habits and what he knows how to do, then you have to, like, he's going to be really a catastrophe in the meantime until you reteach him the right way to do everything. And so he's kind of going to go down before he goes up. He's down. That's it. That's, that's the conspiracy. The YouTube viewers are just treated to Arif Hassan's face during that tinfoil argument. Thank you, Luke Braun. We pivot now to our guest of honor who joins the Minnesota football party. Right. It, hold it. Hold on to it. Maybe Ron Johnson has some thoughts. He's the host of the Ron Johnson Show. He's a former Golden Gopher. He's a Minnesota sports legend, former NFL receiver. Ron Johnson, how's it going? What's going on, guys? I Not don't know a, what I just stepped into, but okay. Yeah, some some serious your uh, average high, feud, high jinks, <laughs> par for the course around here. Ron, it's training camp season. Uh, paint a picture for me. What did training camp look like for you when you reported to Ravens camp? Because I know the Vikings, they're going into like a five star hotel at the Omni. They've got pretty nice accommodations now. It's not the dorm rooms of Mankato anymore. What did it look like for you twenty years ago? Uh, Ravens were good. I mean, we were in a hotel as well, uh, like about 40 minutes outside of Owens Mills. Um, so it was, it was a nice, I forgot what the hotel was. They basically gutted it out, bought the whole hotel out. It was a smaller type of hotel where it's just like two floors type deal. Um, but they, they completely gutted it out, changed it all up for the Ravens. So, you know, the food area was now the training room and, uh, they had a mess hall for us across the street that they had created within this hotel's deal. They had a pool, um, and we were the only ones there. So there were no fans in there. There were no outs, you know, outsiders in there. I don't know if they. I don't think they do that anymore because now they have the new Under Armour facility right on, on the uh, on the grounds. But that's where we were. We were in the hotel, so it, it was nice. The Bears, on the other hand, uh, I think it was Olivet is the city, and yeah, that was a dorm room. That was like hard floors. You got to wear your flip-flops everywhere you go. No carpet. 
uh, that was miserable. And then I coached for the coach and same thing. The coaches had to stay in the dorms. Each coach had to take turns, uh, but I was the grunt. So I had to stay the entire time and same thing, hard no, 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 uh, linoleum floors and just, you know, you want to stay in your bed the entire time you're in your, in your room. You're never going to walk around barefoot unless you're a, a big offensive lineman that doesn't care about your hygiene and or Britney Spears. Um, and, and so that's that's what it was like. It was it was a it was different, you know, groups. Now, now it's it's being pampered. Guys have iPads given to them. They have computers. Um, you know, we, we didn't even, I don't even think Mac was a thing back then. And if it was, it wasn't great. Like we all had like PCs and took a while to get going. You had plug-in internet. Wi-Fi was a thing of like, whoa, what is this? Um, yeah, totally different than it is now. Well, let's go around the circle. Let's pepper Ron Johnson with some training camp talkers. Arif Hassan, what do you got? Yeah, I want to pull into your experience with coaching and being a professional wide receiver. I mean, the Vikings have a really excellent receiver group, obviously at the top level. But, you know, watching these guys in camp, I think that the depth looks really good, too. I'm excited about Amir Smith-Marset. Obviously, we know what K.J. Osborne can do. Uh, and, you know, players even like Byron Mitchell, I think, are, are really performing well in camp. What is it about what Keenan McCardell does as a coach that can really enable these receivers? Because I've seen a lot of player coaches that are not that good. McCardell seems to really nail it. What is it about that? Yeah, I mean, first to be a coach, you have to be able to talk and communicate well. Uh, if you can't communicate what you're trying to say, because some guys that, you know, might say, you know, get the get the skunk off the dog. Like, what? What are you What are you telling me to do? You know, get the pepper out the <laughs> out, out the glass. Like, what? What does that mean? What does that mean? <laughs> get the pepper out the glass. You talking to me? You know, get your chili hot. <laughs> what? <laughs> you know. So you, you gotta, right. you gotta, yeah, I mean, you know, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta be able to communicate and Keenan, like, you know, just talking to him a couple of times, he's a really good communicator. Uh, he, he speaks well, uh, as far as being able to, to, to treat each guy differently. You know, you can tell Justin Jefferson one route and one way to do it, but you have to tell another guy a different way, whether it's, Hey, put a little bit more pressure on this shoulder, lean a little bit this way. Hey, you're giving away your routes. Um, you know, you have to be able to, to, to talk that through with, but you can't just say, Hey man, you're telling the DB what you're doing. It's like, okay, coach, thanks. But what, how can I fix that? You know, a, a guy like Keenan, just watching him, you can see he's really giving these guys like tips and tools and what he's done. Um, but yeah, there's some great receivers out there that, that, that are great receivers, but when it, when they're trying to communicate and tell other receivers what they do and why they're great, that's why Michael Jordan will never be a good coach. Like he's too good. Some guys are just are too good that they don't know how to communicate how to be better. You know, he and Michael Jordan is like, just go do it. Like, just go be great. You know, and that doesn't work. And so I think Keenan McCardell is a great communicator where some guys, you know, the skunk off the dog thing, like, bro, I have no idea what you're telling me to do, but all right. <laughs> no, don't do that. I'm going to get that pepper right off that glass. <laughs> Uh, yeah, so yeah. I, I guess I also want to pull on your experience in particular, like as a wide receiver, um, because when we're at camp, we're watching a lot of one on ones and uh, unless it's, you know, somebody just totally gets beaten or somebody gets like totally blanketed, it's really hard for me to tell who wins like closer reps or it, it more so it's hard for me to tell who's running a good route and who just went up against like a, a you know, who went, when did the corner play bad or something like that so what should i be looking for when it comes to watching these wide receivers and just like individual drills is there any kind of tip off or tell that i should be looking for to tell like who's really running good routes and who is um who like who isn't yeah i mean the one thing i was always taught was chest over knees knees over toes so the receivers that are, are bending at the waist you see adam thielen do it you see justin jefferson do it um you see you know the it's about the amount of time it takes them to get in and out of their break you know it should be a pop pop out and it's like a two-step bang, bang, hard, and then you're out your break. If there's guys that are pitter-pattering and it takes them five to six, you know, stutters to stop and then get back out the route, that's when you see that DB that's in front of them because the DB is thinking, boom, boom, one, two, I got to come back through this route. Um, that's one thing to look right away. If receivers are not getting out their breaks, coming back to the ball, if they're sitting there waiting for the ball on the curl route and the DB is able to reach over their shoulder and bat it down, that's a bad rep. You got to keep coming back to the quarterback until you have the ball in your hands. Uh, and that's not easy to do with, with, with the velocity of a, of a great quarterback like Kirk Cousins, uh, who's a top 12 quarterback in the NFL. Um, it, it's just one of those things when you, when you see the receivers run those routes, when you see the DB make the play, it gives away. Sometimes it's just both are great. Like the receiver ran a great route. The DB is all over them. And at the end of the day, 
he made the play. Um, I just saw a play by Derek Stingley with the Texans. Receivers running a fade route, and he's dancing at the line. He's taking way too much time. And Stingley knows right away this is a fade. Oh, yeah. And he just runs mm -hmm. to the corner. I saw that clip. Um, yeah. That's a horrible route by the receiver because that's like you're watching Instagram. You're watching these receivers on Instagram do all this crap, and you think that works. Yeah, it doesn't work on King great stuff. DBs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah it, it doesn't work on great DBs. And that's mm -hmm. why Terrell Lowens and a lot of these older receivers, you know, people say, oh, okay, boomer, all right, grandpa. It, it doesn't work on a Deion Sanders. Like, he's not going to go for all that. He's going to wait for your hips. Your hips don't lie. Shakira told us. Um, wherever your hips are going, you're going. Your shoulders aren't taking you anywhere. And so great receivers – or, sorry, great DBs watch your belt buckle. I'm not looking at your shoulders and all that crap and your toes and all that. I'm looking at your belt. Where's your belt going? Because your belt's going to take you to where your body has to go. And, and so for Derek Stingley, he saw it right away. So that's what you can kind of see. The other thing, too, if receivers are slipping, uh, if they're falling backwards, uh, those are the things that means they're either stepping on their heels, uh, they're not putting the weight on their balls of their feet, um that that's the key if they're if they're you know slow to get out the route that means they're not putting enough pressure down it's called like an accordion you think about an accordion comes down it comes back up that's what a receiver should look like going into a route and then back out um if they're not doing that that stuff on film a coach will go back and watch like why are you standing straight up if a db is on you you're not you're you know and you bend down a little bit too so a db can't grab your jersey and pull himself through when you're bending down if he reaches it's really like you're gonna see it if you're standing straight up and he can be back to your his chest to your back, that ref can't see him holding that jersey. You got to bend down to show that tug, and there and there's little things like that that Keenan is probably telling the vets. And there's a key: a lot of guys still can't do it. He can tell them a thousand times, and if he can't do it, that's the guys that get cut. And then we're always like, why why they cut this guy? I thought he was having a great camp. We didn't see the little things and one on ones and and some of those meetings individuals. Uh, that the receiver's just not following. And then a lot of times, too, we don't know the route. Like sometimes a route's called or a quarterback calls a route, receiver runs the wrong route. We don't even realize it. Um, but that's stuff that we will never know. I mean, unless you just see a quarterback throw his hands up in there like, what the hell are you doing? We'll never know a wrong route was run. I don't think Kirk's that guy. Tom Brady will tell you. Uh, Aaron Rodgers will probably tell you. Kirk's not that guy. Um, so at least not yet. You know, maybe it's coming. But, no, he's not that guy. So it'll be tough to get keys from him, too, when his receivers don't do what he wanted them to do. Talk about great communicators, man. You should get back into coaching. Yeah, holy smokes, yeah. Ron. Uh, I think I speak for all of us. We could listen to you talk about uh, fundamentals and coaching and, and all these nuances of the game. I'm curious, just because you, you brought up a lot of cool and, and great points about that stuff, is there a player or two that you remember playing with specifically that was just just top of the line, just really wowed you with their fundamentals or uh, ability just to kind of digest the playbook and understand the nuances of the NFL? Could be a receiver or, I guess, anybody that you played with for that matter. Yeah, you know, like I, I'd say being in the locker room for or, you know about six months with Deion Sanders, it was kind of cool to mm. watch him prepare. Even wow. at age 37, he was like 36, I think, when he came to us. Um, but just watching him prepare, watching his clothes be dropped off, like his uniform was dropped off from a special lady <laughs> that like sold his socks. His socks, everybody thought he wore three pairs of socks and he scrunched them up. He never scrunched his socks up. They were sewn like that. So it was an extra long, like, Lyman sock, I guess, and then she sold it so it would have that perfect Dion scrunch. So he didn't actually scrunch his socks up like that. If you go back and watch film now, his socks are always perfectly scrunched. They were sewn like that. There was elastic in there, and they had sewn seams. So watching him prepare, um, I, I think Arif looks cool. like he's going to pop. This rules. <laughs> yeah, that's incredible. Like, at what point did you figure that out and just have to roll with it? Like, oh yeah, you got the sewn socks. That's cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Me too. Me too. De I mean, yeah. I mean, when Dion walks in the locker room, everybody watches. It's just like, right. you know, like I mean, we pl we played the Giants, and he had his own bus, and he talked to Brian Billick and said, "Hey, can I take some of the guys back on my bus from New York to Baltimore?" What? And Brian. <laughs> And Billick allowed it. Like Billick was like, sure, yeah, I mean, they can go back I with you. Be, yeah. And so it was, we, it was, we call it the comma check rule. Like if you didn't have two commas in your check for this week, you're not getting on Dion's bus. And so, you know, like Ray Lewis, Pete Bowyer, uh, you know, Chris McAllister, oh uh, uh, Corey Fuller, the quarter, uh, it was not, 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 uh, not Kyle Bowler. It was like, I think Jeff Blake, like he took one of the older quarterbacks with him. But yeah, it was like eight to nine guys got on Dion's like luxury bus and got to go back from uh, New York to uh, Baltimore on a bus while we all had to go get on the train. 
and uh, take the train back. But you know that that was Dion. Dion was you know he was he was prime time. He walked in. There. I mean he was like I said he was towards the end of his career, but he was still Dion. He still lets you know like when he walks in the room, it's fun. And uh, but no, and so and another thing too, like I coached with uh Reggie Wayne and Marvin Harrison, and it is one thing I say. Brandon Stokely, I play with Brandon Stokely. Brandon Stokely was one of the most sound receivers when it came to to, to just running routes, mm. and it showed when he got with Peyton Manning because if you don't remember, he had ten touchdowns with Peyton Manning. Mm -hmm. Peyton Manning had three receivers in double digit touchdowns. Stokely was one of them. Uh, that was one of you know Manning's best years. Uh, with that group and stokely was extremely he was the one that showed me the whole chest i mean he would touch the ground running curl routes and he would touch the ground running comebacks and doing cone drills to show how low he was to the ground and that's why he rarely got grabbed in the slot uh, but then coaching marvin harrison and reggie wayne i mean i learned a ton as a coach i mean i'm just telling these guys the routes that's called i'm talking to peyton manning about what's the plays for the day but we got on the field i mean reggie would come to me like hey if i'm standing up tell me that means i'm tired uh, you know, Marvin saying that, hey, after I run a deep ball, have somebody ready to go because I'm not coming back to the huddle. I mean, they would wow. they would they were like they had their stuff down to a T because they didn't huddle with the coach. The receivers right. all stayed in a loose huddle. Peyton had a loose huddle with the lineman and then he would just create the play from the line of scrimmage and then everybody walked to the line. And so Marvin and Reggie knew, like, hey, if we run a go route, I'm not running back in practice. Like, hey, get somebody else in there for me, coach. And then they could do the next play with Peyton. And then they'd be right back up, though. As soon as they walk back, they're right back up for the next play. Those rookies or whoever took his spot, Pierre Garcon or whoever it was, knew, okay, hey, <laughs> Reggie's back. He's back up. But, yeah, and same with, like, Receivers and DBs, Reggie Wayne and Marvin Harrison always made sure they went with the top guy. So they weren't going with the rookie that wasn't going to make it because that rookie just wants to do it. Like, oh, I want to go against Reggie Wayne. He's like, what am I going to learn from this? If I beat you, I'm not getting better. Give me Marlon Jackson. You know, give me the starter. I want Kelvin Hayden. You know, I want the guy that's going to be there on Sunday because he and I are going to make each other better. And, and that's what those guys did. They competed every single day. And so I learned a ton from them as a coach, just watching them interact, watching them work. I mean, the funniest story is coming into meetings and Reggie Wayne had his he headphones in and a hoodie up. And I look back and I'm like, man, you couldn't do this with the Ravens. And I looked at the receivers coach and he's like, yeah, Reggie's got the playbook down. He's good. And they just let Reggie sit through the entire meeting with his headphones on. Who knows what he was listening to, but he got to sit through the whole meeting with his headphones on. Uh, so, yeah, I, I mean, I learned all of that. I learned there's levels to this. Like, rookies and vets can't do the same thing. Um, and, and that's what I think these guys get out of, you know, as far as the best guys I've seen do it. It's the guys that earn the right to do the things they do on the field. And that's where these young guys with the Vikings and, you know, and Justin Jefferson, they want to get to that. They want to get to the point where everything they're doing is repetition is perfect. And, uh, I mean, I don't think you'll see Justin Jefferson going up against some of these younger DBs. Um, I guess he's going to go Cam Dantzler or Patrick Peterson or, you know, or, or Booth. Like, I don't think he's going to waste his time with those other guys. You can get stories and takes like this on yeah. the daily on the Ron Johnson great. show with Ron Johnson. <laughs> In closing, Ron, I know, you know, I, I can't find any box scores from the 2002 Ravens preseason, so I need you to, to tell us. <laughs> give us give us a glimpse of what it was like for you because we've got football tonight, Ron. We've got Raiders and Jaguars. The preseason is underway. So in, in that spirit, give us a preseason story or two of when you were breaking into the league. And remember, we can't fact check you, so we're just going to believe you. <laughs> yeah. you, well, you, believe you had 200 so yards. So one story I it. did not know. Yeah, one story I did not know from Herm Edwards, because Herm Edwards was the coach of the Jets. Uh, my first touchdown was against him. Uh, and that was like his first, I don't know if it was his first year or second year with the Jets. Uh, but yeah, I, I caught my first, and it was preseason, so it didn't actually count. My first touchdown was against the Jets. Uh, so I do remember that was like a one-handed, like kind of dig route across the back of the end line. Uh, and I kind of came down with it. Uh, and then just I, I just remember, like, I mean, honestly, being a rookie, so that that's the difference. I had – and then even a second-year guy, I had to play the entire game. You know, our veterans, Brandon mm -hmm. Stokely, Travis Taylor, Marcus Robinson, Frank Sanders, Todd Heat, those guys got to play one or two series, and they were resting. So I actually would end games, you know, six, seven catches, eight, nine catches, because I had to play – first to fourth quarter like the rookie i mean I, every once in a while they let me come out in the fourth and some of the undrafted guys would get in but for the rookies like billick was all about us playing as much as possible so we can get ready that if he especially if he knew he was going to keep you to get ready for the season uh he would let the older guys walk out but the younger guys he wanted to make sure we knew the playbook uh we knew we had to play and i had to play every position because i was an outside x but then i also had to play y which is like the 
quote unquote tight end in some of the four receiver sets. So I had to know the inside, the outside. I had to know, you know, the blocking off the tight end as a bigger receiver. Uh, so, yeah, so he kept me in a lot. So, yeah, so my box scores, they were they were eight, nine catches, but that's only because I had to play the whole game. And then usually by the third, fourth quarter, you're playing against, you know, DBs that probably aren't going to make the team. So, yeah, but no, it, it was it was like that. It was it was basic stuff. I mean, regular season games, I think I ended up like in the end of the season, it's like 30, 40 catches. So it was, you know, two catches a game, three catches a game. Nothing, no, nothing spectacular. I never had a huge, you know, 10 catch game. Uh, and because we didn't throw the ball, we threw the ball 10 times against the Cleveland Browns. Uh, and Jamal Lewis rushed for 295 yards. So that's the kind of offense we had with Kyle Bowler. Like, we weren't throwing the ball. You got one opportunity, you better catch it because it's not coming back. So we were a different breed back then We're running the ball. Ron, I while you were talking, I found a story, Dateline, August 21st, 2002, written by Jamison Hensley. It says, the one who has exceeded camp expectations on the offensive side was receiver Ron Johnson, in two That's preseason you. games, hey, the rookie <laughs> out of Minnesota has nine catches for 99 yards and scored the only touchdown for the Ravens offense. So there oh, you go. I fact-checked you. The touchdown was real. Uh, Ron Johnson, <laughs> thank you so much for joining us. That's not saying much, though. Through. We ran the ball. Like, that's not so we had Chester Taylor, Jamal Lewis, uh, and Alan Ricard. Ogden, Jonathan Ogden. Yeah. yeah. Jonathan Ogden. We were running the ball. You know, we had uh, Orlando Zeus Brown. I mean, you know, like, we had two of the biggest tackles in the world, and we had one of the best running backs in the country. Uh, yeah, we weren't, we weren't throwing the ball. So the only touchdown, that's not saying much. The first game against my first NFL game against the Panthers, I think I caught the only touchdown in that game too, in 2002. So that's not saying a lot. That happened a lot where <laughs> one of us caught a touchdown and then we ran the crap off the ball. Like that was our offense. <laughs> it even it. happened in the Super Bowl year, I think, with Shannon Sharp. Like, mm -hmm. I think that one long catch against the uh, Raiders was like the only throw Trent Dilfer threw that game. Like it was, Jeez. that's what Bill Billick felt like was going to win him a Super Bowl. Mm hmm Ron, thanks for Love joining it. us. Love We're going to push people to the show, the Ron Johnson Show, daily on Lockdown Sports Minnesota. Thanks a lot, Ron. Hey, I thanks, expect Ron. all four of you guys to have a, a tinfoil hat by next week. So. 100%. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Love it. And that was great, by the way. Wow. I love, I love the look back into Reggie Wayne, Marvin Harrison, uh, Deion Sanders. That's, that's really good stuff from Ron Johnson. I want to, in our final minutes, get into the Irv Smith conversation. Irv Smith, thumb surgery, out for the preseason. Let's just get your concern level 1 through 10. We'll go reverse this time. Luke, Braun, kick us off. Uh, we'll go like a 3. So the Vikings insist that he'll be back by the opener. Um, it is not an injury related to his knee. That's a big deal for me. If it were like a leg thing, even if it were like an ankle or a calf, I'd be a little worried there. But it just happens to be an unlucky thing on another totally separate part of his body. Um, so I, I feel like I can a little bit trust that they, if they, they wouldn't say, you know, we expect him back by the season opener if that was a, like, that's a risky thing to say if you're not sure. Um, however, there's still some level of concern for me because of other instances of this injury and having surgery to repair it that we know of. The first one that comes to mind is Drew Brees a couple years ago, missed five weeks and five weeks from that surgery would be week one. Um, but Drew Brees said he wasn't quite all the way healed and he went out there. Now quarterback wear and tear is different than like a, a like catching the ball wear and tear. So I, I don't know if that's necessarily the same thing, might not be the same procedure. There's all kinds of details that I don't know that could be different that mean that this is a, a more minor or a more major instance of that injury. But comparing it to other instances, week one seems like it's kind of pushing it. Um, or it. But if it's not week one, it's week two. And if it's not week two, it's week three. And if it's not week three, something else went wrong. Luke Inman. One to ten. Yeah, yeah, that's a good point. I'm going to go with a five point eight, and <laughs> the reason being professional no, Luke, score. Lou brings up a great point, though. I mean, we, we kind of underplay it or, or downplay it because it's just a finger. But you know, all of a sudden you come out there week one or week two, and and you're trying to catch a, a fastball on a seven yard curl route, and you, you all of a sudden is it is it ever going to be one hundred percent healthy? I don't know. 
So is it one of these things too, where Irv Smith's just maybe one of these unlucky guys who just keeps getting hurt, finding ways to uh, not stay healthy? That's another concern too, because I think it was you who brought up Tyler Conklin. There's no Tyler Conklin on this team right now that has been sitting on this team in the same offense for three, four years that's ready to kind of bust out and take on that number one role. Johnny Munt, more of a blocking tight end. Zach Davidson, I don't know, buy low maybe. It sounds like he's making some plays out there. But it, there's no replacement on that Tyler Conklin type of level. So Irv Smith comes back week one, best case scenario. But is he fully healthy the rest of the year? I, I'm not sure. That That's what concerns me the most. That's why I jumped from a three to that 5.8. Arif, are you jealous that I stole Zach Davidson as my guy from under your nose? He was never my guy. Matthew Collar keeps on saying he uh, is going to be my guy because I tweeted about him once. He was never my guy. I didn't think it was a good pick. I already had my narrative set on Zach Davidson. Uh, I have to commit to him busting. So uh, he's an anti-my guy. I am rooting against him. He has to prove <laughs> me wrong. This is bulletin board material Jesus. for Zach Davidson. Um, no, I'm helping him. Um, okay. So, so he can uh, run twenty point nine miles per hour. Yeah, rate but he's not in the mile per hour club. We know about that club. He's not in it. So until uh, yeah. then, he's going to get there though. Yeah, if you say so. Uh, he's tired now. I don't know if he can. Get there. <laughs> he just um, ran twenty point nine miles per hour. <laughs> yeah. Tired. So, uh, so with Irv Smith, uh, my my level of concern, uh, I thought it was actually going to be a little bit higher than everybody else, but it turns out it's lower. I'm at a four. Um, it's it's a relatively minor injury. They expect him back by week one. This is not the previous coaching staff, so I'm going to give them um, the lenience to uh, assume that they're telling mostly the truth at this point uh, with, with regard to injuries, especially because they've been much more forthcoming than they need to be when it comes to injuries. So I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt and say that there's a good expectation for week one or week two. Obviously, I'm concerned about the depth, and that's why I was concerned, um, is just that that depth is not there. Um I do like what I've seen from Johnny Munt in camp, but, you know, it's it, it's pretty whatever. It's really difficult to especially evaluate tight ends. Um, but, you know, I don't think Irv Smith is actually particularly injury prone. I think that, you know, that is we're building that up because he's missed a lot of games, but he's only had two injuries prior to this. And one of those injuries was extremely minor. He missed like three games in 2019 um, and uh, or uh, 2020. I don't think he missed any games in 2019. Um, and so he's got this one injury. It's an MCL injury for for 2021 and now there's something that's not a big deal you take a look at injury predictor he's only got two dots on him right like i've i've seen players play full 16 game seasons or i guess now 17 game seasons that have had a, a much longer injury history that we don't call injury prone and that's fine i don't think that this is a particular concern of mine especially because it's not a repeat contact area if he had a knee injury i'd be much more concerned but this is a thumb injury. It is not repeatable to me. So, um, you, uh, oh no, you're only going to get Irv Smith for you know 15 games of the year. That's already within the re realm of expectation for tight ends anyway. So um, you're still, uh, but the, a good year for him is still on the books. You could still get 800 yards out of him uh, in a in a breakout type season for him. Um, but you know those first couple of games might be a big concern, and I would like to see more tight end depth. Yeah, I'll go with about a 5.2 concern. I think that Irv Smith is at a position where it would be really useful to have these reps in the preseason because tight end has to line up all across the line, in line, maybe in the backfield, in the slot, out wide if you're athletic like Irv. And he's got to learn blocking assignments associated with all of those and the route concepts they're trying to teach. So there's a lot to learn. And I know Irv Smith was one guy who was a little slower to pick up the offense when he came into the league as well. So, you know, just adjusting to this new scheme, it's obviously beneficial to be out there on the field. He can still learn in the classroom too. But being out there on the field for this month, um, pretty helpful. So he's going to miss that. And I do worry too about the depth. Now, Johnny Munt really hasn't been given a chance. I mean, he's got like 100 routes run on passing plays in his career in five seasons. So... I mean, there's a reason he hasn't been elevated up the Rams depth chart, but also he's never really been given an opportunity to have that chance. So maybe Johnny Munt's got a little something left in him, but Zach Davidson, my guy, has been busy at camp. Not always perfect. A couple balls off his hands. He fumbled yesterday. That's not great, but he's making a lot of catches too. And did I mention? Yeah, because Kellen Mond keeps checking down. I, we've been over this. <laughs> Kellen Mond, I'm changing my tune. He knows who the playmakers are. <laughs> In his route tree. He gets it. This guy, we're on the same page. 
Closing minutes of the show. Um, let's, t- I don't know, table the Anthony Barr talk. Obviously, he's going to link up with Zimmer when Zimmer becomes the defensive coordinator next year. So this of is course. like incredible foresight on Anthony Barr's part. Put him on the Byron Buxton plan with that knee over in Dallas. Um, I want someone to convince me why I should watch Raiders Jaguars tonight. Anyone? Uh, football is back, and this is going to be hilarious. Are you kidding me? <laughs> Jaguars backups? Oh, <laughs> super funny. Uh, yeah, speaking of Jaguars backups, Laquan Treadwell wearing number 18 tonight. Watch out. Look at that. Watch out. Randy Moss's old number for like. Uh, <laughs> there you go. Brief, brief. I scoured the betting line at betonline.net, our good partners. Minus two and a half. Raiders, players, right? Raiders minus 2.5, which is an absurd line. And I'll tell you why. Also, the over under is like 30, which it's like 29. is beautiful. hilarious. Yeah, going to be a disaster. Um, but you know why this? that's an absurd line? Because the Jaguars are underdogs. And do you know who the Jaguars' fourth quarterback is? Oh, no. Anyone? Is it Kyle Slaughter? Kyle Slaughter. Kyle. Oh, my God. Uh, I'm going all in on the Raiders. Got it. Yep. Why? He's a preseason god. (laughs) Yeah, but in the NFL, they they can't talk to him all the way up until the snap like they could in the USFL. (laughs) Can he call a play yet? (laughs) <laughs> I don't know. I don't know where you guys were in 2018, 2019, but I'm okay, taking so he, he does have one of the highest preseason passer ratings of all time. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't point out that that is shockingly not very stable. So <laughs> he did it like four years in a row. Seems pretty stable to me. Also, I'm just riling you up. I don't think Kyle Slaughter is good. Party fouls this week. The biggest blunders. The biggest mishaps. The biggest foibles of the week. Um, I had a tough time this week coming up with anything dynamic from Vikings World. So how about the umpire that gave four strikes in a baseball game yesterday? <laughs> oh, um, that rules. That's that a major great. party foul, but also no one caught it. Like there wasn't even an argument. So was the it guy was just? It, wait, was it a major league baseball game or uh, Astros Red Sox? The no, batter, the TV, the TV catches it right. A little the, dot. There's no, a fantastic no. John Boyce video on this. This happens. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but the announcers didn't catch it. The TV bug didn't seem to adjust. Well, I think it had and, two strikes on the count. Uh, but the way the umpire reacted, he didn't mm-hmm. ring him up. Right? He just gave right. it. You know, that's a strike. And everybody, mm-hmm. you know, the batter was like, <laughs> "Note, right. you that's didn't ring me up. All right, all right." A little cool. note there, a little memo for you. That one was a strike. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. He grounded exactly. out anyway, so it didn't really matter. Uh, that's my party foul for the week. Anybody else? How about the Saints? They kicked out Trevor Penning after three incidents, starting three fights yeah, in three days. Party fouls on Penning. Come party on, man. On Penning. <laughs> they should be naming him, uh, you know, practice player of the week for that. He's an offensive lineman in the trenches getting nasty. What more do you want? Isn't that why you drafted yeah, af- him? A- after a whistle and then a separate unnecessary whistle to get him specifically to stop. Love it. <laughs> Andrew Booth I'll... Jr. is going to go for that at some point. Yeah. He's, <laughs> yeah he's is that our odds on favorite? Intensity. Is he the favorite to start a fight here in camp? Oh, participate. He's got to be, right? Sure. He's okay. been jawing the whole time. He's going to induce okay. a fight or start a fight. Okay. That's for sure. And who do you think he'll pick a fight with? Because I probably, uh, probably receiver, Justin, right? Justin Amir Smith Marset. So it's going to okay. be a different. Yeah, Amir Smith Marset is the okay. probably the most likely to respond to his bait. I love it. I love yeah. It. Uh, how about um, what was the second thing the NFL did? I remember the Deshaun Watson thing, and then the uh, oh, the Miami Dolphins. Yeah, party foul. Uh, you just admit that the Miami Dolphins tanked. Like you have all the evidence, <laughs> and and all you are saying is yeah. So. We agree that Stephen Ross told multiple members of the front office that it would be better to prioritize the 2020 draft over the 2019 win-loss record. We agree that Stephen Ross told Brian Flores that he'd pay him $100,000 if he lost games, but uh, he, was, he was joking, I think. So uh, it wasn't until Brian Flores put it in writing in a written memo that uh, we should probably stop talking about ways that I will lose games that they stopped, right? Um but that there's no punishment for that. They didn't find that there was any evidence of tanking. I understand that the league is putting up the fiction that they have like some level of integrity to the game or whatever, right? That you can uh, reliably predict results because everyone's acting with the same incentives. But you know, we know that that's not the case. The NFL should be punishing the Dolphins uh, significantly. But of course, 
getting an employee to punish their employer, i.e. Roger Goodell, to punish the Dolphins uh, is pretty difficult. So I, that's my party file, I guess. I'm going to go with not the bummer and instead make fun of the Arizona Cardinals. Uh, they extend DJ Humphreys, their left tackle, who has been, will go with up and down, to a $66.8 million three-year deal with half of that Ooh. guaranteed, and he's earning $21 million this year. Now, that's going to be mitigated because I'm sure some of that uh, signing bonus that gets prorated and all that stuff, but that is a, uh, I'm going to call that a commitment to mediocrity. Uh, with a quarterback you just got into bed with that they might not even like that much. I don't know. The Cardinals feel like they are committing to a very tumultuous build here. Like It feels kind of predictable that this is going to go south, and they're locking themselves in with it. If the Cardinals did their independent study on the film, Luke, and they found out through the film that DJ Humphreys is indeed worthwhile to invest in so dj uh, humphreys is what their best offensive lineman i couldn't name three cardinals offensive linemen i just had to look it up their other starting tackle is kelvin beecham will hernandez hey. and justin Pugh inside at will guard hernandez and rodney hudson rodney I, hudson. I remember when kelvin beecham was good yeah yeah, yeah that was the thing ago. so dj hump so they just paid their best offensive lineman okay yeah see come on come on right. oh they got danny isadora third team guard wow whoa yeah, he's hanging around. Oh, he should have been in our rank him last he was a fifth, episode. He was a fifth round pick, right? He wouldn't have counted. Yeah, fifth round Miami. Yeah, yep. yeah, probably. I, I, right. I yeah. get what you're saying. Also, he would have jumped at the top of the rank. So it for sure. Yeah. <laughs> uh, hey, at least they got a seventh Arif. out of him. <laughs> that's yeah, true. that's true. That's true. Thank you, Luke. Thank you, Arif, and thank you to Ron Johnson as well. Yeah, the show is the uh, Minis blah, 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 blah. the show is the Minnesota Football Party. It airs Mondays and Thursdays. And if you're watching on YouTube, this is how you subscribe to the podcast. Find Locked On Sports Minnesota for the feed. There you get the Ron Johnson Show, Superior Sports Talk, and this program with this panel. Um, also, check us out on Twitter at Locked On. M I N locked on Vikings daily with Luke Braun. Arif Hassan's work is at the athletic and uh, I'm Sam Ekstrom. I've got content on the YouTube channel from Vikings training camp as well. So there's all your content that you need in your life. Thank you for watching. Tune in Monday, the Minnesota football party signing out.